This is a site administration for end users video and we're looking at module 2 and in this case we're looking at the first four topics of the module securable elements, define your site community, users and groups and default SharePoint groups. Now when we talk about the securable elements what we're trying to do is keep the delegates very clear and understanding about what we're discussing in this module. So we break them down into three completely separate elements. Discuss the users and groups. Keep that simple, maybe create a group. Then we look at the permissions, mainly what the site collection administrator does with this element. And then at the end we look at the securable objects. Now when you're talking about creating a site, as an owner or a site collection administrator, you need to define your site community. A community is made up of people and groups, or users and groups, that define purpose to the site. Each person, each group has a role to fill. Some users, some groups might have two or three roles, but your community will allow you to define and see what they're doing and why. Groups live at the top of the site collection. So when you build your subsite, no matter how it's structured, when you define and create and use your users and groups, the other subsites can also see those users and groups. Think of your users and groups as the family tree. No matter how your family is organized and how they relate to each other, they all belong to the same family. Let's look at this family of users and groups. Firstly, we'll look at this sentence. I need Alan to contribute to this site. Now I can see Alan is the user, uh, which is an account in SharePoint that can be accessed by a person to do particular work. And I can see contribute is a permission level, giving me an understanding of what things he can or cannot do inside the site. But from a site collection administrator's point of view, this isn't enough. It doesn't define purpose. Why is Alan contributing? What's he contributing for? So we use groups as best as possible to define roles. Roles can give us an indication of action. Why is Alan contributing? He's contributing because he's a member, an editor, an author. Let's define this sentence again. I need Alan to contribute to this site as an approver. Straight away, I know what Alan needs to do and why. Again, Alan, the user, with his permission level, is now defined together by his group. And we've used a group here as a role. Let's look at this sentence. Amanda will also become an approver. To the site collection administrator, we understand the name of the person, and we also know Amanda's group. The group defines the permission to the owner. The owner understands what the group is for and will decide what action, what permissions that group will need to that owner's particular site. Let's look at the default groups that we get within a SharePoint team site. We call this the OMV, Owners, Members and Visitors. As you can see, an owner has full control over the site. When you define your users and your groups, it's always a good idea to define the expectations that you're looking for. Every owner within their site may have different expectations, but by defining the groups, we're defining the typical roles that they play. Here are those groups as you'd see them inside a team site's permissions. As you can see, we've got the members, owners, and visitors. We've also got the administrator as an individual user account and as well as the system account. The system account has limited access and this allows the system account to pull information from the site to update searchability and crawling certain timer jobs to keep information going. We also have our viewers. They have a view only permission level. We'll look at the difference between view only and read later. Now these are the typical team site or collaboration site groups. Owners, members, visitors and viewers. 
if you're working with a publishing site you'll also get approvers, designers, hierarchy managers, restricted readers and style resource readers. So here I am inside my project instructor site and the first thing I'm going to do is show you the people and groups page. So I'm going to go to the site actions menu top left hand corner go down into site settings at the bottom and on the site settings page you can see the users and permissions group at the top I'm going to click people and groups now when you go into this option by default it takes you into the most common group in this case the members group so you can see I'm looking at my project instructor members I don't have any members so I'm going to add new members to my group click the drop down arrow there's only one option there and that's to add users give that a click now I'm in the classroom and this is usually already done in advance what you can do is quickly remove your members before you demonstrate so I could add student 01 student 02 etc separating them with a semicolon. This could go on forever. Don't forget we have 24 student accounts. I would typically want to add them all. The other issue is within the people picker control, which is what you're using, it has a limit of 256 characters. So that could be quite messy if you're adding multiple users and groups into this box. In the classroom server is a group called projects. Now this is a security group. A security group is a group that comes from your Active Directory. So if I click the check names, you'll find it has found this security group. It's got the domain at the beginning, backslash, and then projects. Projects is where student1, student24, and instructor all reside. So that's a much quicker way to put it in and it's a good demonstration to the delegates about how to use Active Directory security groups within your permissions and your groups. Now there's a, a negative to this I can't email to the projects and I want to demonstrate emailing to you so for that reason I'm going to add only the people in the room it takes a bit of time but what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to send this welcome email if you've not seen this email before, it is very long, very horrible. In fact, what I could do is actually send it with a little personal message so you can see just how horrible it looks. And so I can witness this, I'm going to add myself. So I don't have to log in, log out. I can receive the email myself so you can witness what it looks like. So I'm going to put in here, here is my message. I'm going to put it in capitals so that it will stand out as best as it possibly can and I'm going to click OK and here we have my 10 students and myself and that should have generated the email so I'm now going to go into my Outlook account and display my Outlook messages now for full appreciation I'm going to open the message up in its own window and you can see that's quite a bit of text to read at the end of the day you might want to just keep things simple and to the point that you require them to know. I could keep the hyperlinks that are already there and that is the site location or URL and also the link for where the members are. And this is quite straightforward. What I do first is select the users I wish to receive this new message. I then go to the actions menu and I email users. The users appear in the recipients list. I just add the subject I require and then add my content. Now, this content could be saved as draft, so you could use this for every time you add members to any particular group. Now, with this text I've supplied, what I could do is highlight some of these words here and use these as the hyperlinks to those two locations. So I'll start with the project members list first because I already have that page on screen. So I'm going to go to my Project Instructor Members, I'm going to copy the URL, go back to Outlook, create a hyperlink, I use Control K here as usual, I'm going to paste that in and then click OK and do the same thing with the Project Instructor Site URL. 
So I'm going to go back to the home page, copy the URL, and add it as a hyperlink. There we go. Now I'll send that message. I've sent it to myself. So if I go into Outlook, lo and behold, there's my message with the links taking me to the two key areas. The addition is I can actually add my own URL hyperlinks into that message, which you couldn't do from that text box that's generated 